to see your face. Okay, well, I got to get the, the, get this thing going. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And thank you for joining us, uh, spending your Thursday afternoon with us for our after, after lunch IT webinar series. And today we're going to be talking about cloud security challenges during the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. And uh, welcome to all the attendees. Once again, thank you for taking the time out of your day. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to Ala Karachenko, Audra Methin, uh, Dean Kiefer, John Clay, and the rest of the Trend Micro team. They've been a great partner. They've supported us uh, for the last several years, and they've got an excited, energetic crew. They always, they always want to help and contribute to the community. Uh, and uh, now I want to introduce our uh, panelists today. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, after I introduce them, we're going to have some Q&A. Uh, I might pop in a poll question or two that we developed and then answer your questions. So as we go through this, think of what you want to ask. We really uh, value the audience engagement we get. We've got a pretty, intelli pretty intelligent audience out there, uh, count yourself included in that. But real quick, we'll just do the introductions. We've got Nagesh Rowe. Hi, Nagesh. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Great, great. And where are you out of today? I am out of Albany, New York today. Albany, New York. Okay. I'm, I'm visiting my parents, so um, check. It. I'm on annual leave, actually, but I, uh, uh, I, Tom is such a dear, near and dear friend. I, I opted to take a little bit of my vacation time, uh, well, sacrifice a little bit of it for this event. I wanted to help out. Um, well, and, certainly and, appreciate that and, and welcome, and I hope your parents are doing well. That's one good thing about pandemic. We have a chance to do all of our, our our family obligations and get those well, get those done and i do want to just acknowledge my parents for a second if you don't mind because i i think it's a big deal you know this past week i've been on the road with my wife we went to detroit and now we're in albany for the remainder of the trip but my dad is 79 and he is still seeing patients he's a medical doctor he's wow. on the front line and he refuses to quit he actually came out of semi-retirement back full force to go and help the cause. At 79, I, my, my only thing is I hope when I'm his age, 40 years from now, that uh, uh, 39 years from now, that I will have the same tenacity and grit that he does. At least half that's, of that. That's ama amazing. And there, there's no fear there, I guess. Uh, just, uh, that's fantastic. I'm glad you had the opportunity to take advantage of and go up and, and see him while you're on vacation and doing this webinar. Uh, next up, uh, Robert, Bobby Duffy. How are you doing there today, Bobby? Good afternoon, Tom. How are you? It's great to be back with ATARC and, and supporting these I know. We'll, sessions. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about your, your new role. And you're, out of, you're in Alexandria today? I live, yeah, Alexandria, Virginia, right from the home. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, next up, Renata Spinks with the United States Marine Corps. We don't usually, we didn't get you in a parking lot today. Usually we get you in a parking lot outside your skiff. No, 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 no. So we, we have new rules now. So we can't, we can't be outside with the videos and things. So I made sure that I got to my daughter's apartment okay. where I am now. And um, she has me all nice and set up. <laughs> yep. And uh, uh, Dr. George Duchak, thank you for coming today. And where's your base of operations? I think we got a little freeze there. Did we? Can you hear me, Doctor Duchak? Alyssa, we'll uh, we'll go do some tech tech there. Maybe we can get him just on the on the on the video. Sorry, we're having a little trouble with the audio, Doctor Duchak. We can't hear you, um, Alyssa. If you can work on that. And uh, Jerry, Karen, Department of State. Hey, good afternoon, Hi, Jerry. Tom. Hey, how are you? Great, great, oh. great. And where where are you out of? I have been working in the office four days a week. Um, that's why you don't see me because our cameras won't work on the browser-based uh, <laughs> webinar. So, but I am in the office. So I've been coming in the office all through this. Wow. Wow, we'll have to ask you a little bit about that with the with I think there'd be it's not exactly IT, but it would just be how the procedures are working there. And yep. uh, uh, and next up, well, let's go with uh, John with Trend Micro. 
Thank you for coming today, John. Yeah, Tom, and uh, welcome. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to uh, talk today. I'm working out of my home office in uh, Colorado. I've been doing that for 20 years now, so this pandemic didn't change a whole lot for me, other than I don't travel anymore. I don't, you know, I usually go to conferences and stuff, but uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing a lot of the information that we have from our customer base around, you know, the threats targeting them in the cloud and challenges they're having mm -hmm. migrating to the cloud and all that. So I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing uh, all my fellow panelists as well and what their experiences are. So uh, thanks for having me. Great, no, no problem. So uh, maybe we can, with each of the panelists, we can take some time to talk about your, your situation with your uh, organization and uh, you know, how cloud computing and security, with, as we've migrated a lot of people offsite and things have been changing, we've had to stand up some new applications. Uh, presumably a lot of those are going in the cloud. Uh, maybe we can start off with you, Renata, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I think the, the first challenge is probably um, the expansion of our VPNs. That was the first step that we, we had to do from the very beginning. We were better lucky than good because we already had an enterprise infrastructure modernization um, project that was fully funded. That's, that's a big deal in the, DO, in the DOD when you have a project that's fully funded. Um, yeah. So because of that, um, we did not face a lot of the challenges that our Air Force and Army and Navy counterparts were facing, um, spinning up a new commercially virtual environment that um, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard about, CVR. Um, but I think the challenge for us came from being in the midst of the enterprise infrastructure modernization, um, modernizing all our base posting stations, all the routers, all the switches, um, just so we could get to the cloud only to to realize our path uh, needed also update right so that is my great to the joint regional security stacks um, otherwise known as jrss so we had a lot of in parallel things happening so we adopted a little bit of an agile um framework very quickly because it was so many things we had to do in parallel to deliver value to 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 our um constituents I think the challenge was more of the pace that we were having to operate in. Um, you know, the challenge with a lot of our sister agencies was funding and pace. Um, ours was mostly the pace and resourcing from a personnel perspective. And I, I'll let you go to, to the other teams before I tell you about all the challenges we faced doing that. Okay. Great, great. And uh, Dr. Duchak, do we have, we have you? We're going to get you no matter what, right? It's, I think you're back on. At least we got you on audio. I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm on, I was on mute. Can you hear me now? Great, great. Well, welcome to our panel. Uh, and where are you hailing out of today? Huh, Northern Virginia. Okay. I usually am there, but today I'm in the, actually the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee on a workation. Um, <laughs> That's hence the interesting studio hookup here that I have. Uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, Dr. Dujak, since we have you on, uh, you want to kind of cover some of the challenges that you've had at, at the DLA, um, you know, with with all this transition and, and, and a lot of things changing around since COVID-19. Yeah, maybe uh, just let me give just a little bit of background on uh, DLA, just so the audience knows who we are. Uh, you know, we're a combat logistics agency and we uh, provide uh, you know, global logistics for the uh, warfighter. Uh, we work with over uh, 12,000 suppliers uh, and we do an astonishing 9,000 contract actions per day and manage about 272 billion in active contracts with uh, 5.2 million line items. About 99% of all our ordering, billing and inventory uh, is automated and somewhere between 92, 94% of all our procurement is automated. We run nine supply chains, uh, have a, uh, a global network that extends to 46 states, 28 countries, with about 26,000 employees and about uh, 100,000 endpoints. And last year, our, uh, our revenue was $43 billion. Now I say revenue because we work, we're a working capital fund organization which means we don't get appropriated dollars. So we buy products 
uh, in in bulk, get some uh, economies of scale and buying power, and then sell them to the services, uh, whole of government, and uh, in some cases, uh, foreign foreign countries as well. So we're forced to operate like a, uh, a not-for-profit business, uh, paying uh, careful attention to being efficient and being able to deliver the right product at the right time you know, to the customer. So you, you asked about this, uh, the COVID. We went, uh, we went from about 7,000 external connections a day to over 25,000 uh, connections just overnight. And we we're able to do that because of the architecture that we had sized using our uh, virtual desktop initiative. Uh, largely uh, allows uh, people to work from just about any location and tunnel into our network. Uh, so it was relatively frictionless for us to, you know, ramp up. Great. Yeah, I mean, it's a very sprawling organization and, and you, you guys uh, really have an expansive mission there. Thank you very much for that. And we'll get to some questions in a bit. Um, Jerry Karen, Department of State, one of our favorites. He's been on our program a few times. Yes, how are you doing today? Um, Fantastic. So we we have a pretty good success story. We were able to ramp things up pretty quick, and and it's and the way we're organized, it was pretty amazing because everybody had a singular mission and knew what needed to happen when when this all kind of hit for us. So um, we we did a lot of modernization on the fly. Um, so to speak, we um, upgraded our firewalls. We increased bandwidth capacities. We were up to, at one point, I think our highest we had, and this is worldwide, um, over 80% of our workforce teleworking. Of course, we have other enclaves, so people did have to come in. That's why I come in the office. We have other networks and stuff. Um, and being the network person, as well as the perimeter person, um, it, it went pretty well. One of the great things we had already done is we pretty much migrated everybody to a cloud instance for their email and files and folders and things like that. So we turned on browser-based, which made that easy. So a lot of people, that's all they needed. Um, then we, then, but they needed some access to some on-premise services, not everything necessarily. So we, we um, evaluated a bunch of those applications that people were requesting and put them on a proxy. Um, we were able to authenticate through multi-factor authentication. So we had a lot of good things and security practices in place like conditional access, multi-factor, everybody 100% on multi-factor authentication from outside. Uh, we had mobile capability, different types of mobile capabilities, a full laptop that is just like a desktop um, if you're in the office. We had uh, mobile capabilities, uh, BYOD capabilities. So we were in pretty good position. We just had to ramp things up a little quicker than you would normally do. Great. And maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, TIC 3.0. Just give us a little update what's going on there and maybe talk about the work that you're doing at ATARC, uh, yep. how, how we're handling that. That'd be kind of a nice little bonus that you can give us. Yeah, sure. And I and if you haven't seen, um, CISA from DHS has published the final TIC 3.0 documentation. Um, but we have a working group under the Cloud Modernization Working Group within ATARC. Um, I'm leading the TIC 3.0 working group, and we have about five to six vendors uh, participating in the group, some uh, government agency representation as well. And what we are doing is um, each vendor is setting up a proof of concept within a, a, a facility that will be able to present their TIC 3.0 solutions. They're going against a set of use cases as well as technical requirements. Um, we, they're currently building. I know one of the vendors is done right now. Um, the other ones are building. So at some point within the next month or two, we hope to showcase that um, and have, I, I think, talking to Tom, a webinar where each vendor can, can showcase their TIC 3.0 capabilities. It's pretty exciting. We've been talking a lot internally, reviewing each one's um, architecture um and it's been it's been pretty that group has grown and grown and grown so anybody yeah. that's interested of course um please reach out um you can reach out to atark um the tick the tick 3.0 group is working group is on the website there and we can get you added uh, it's it's been a great conversation um it's been a lot of great ideas um even the monitoring aspects of 
How do you monitor the tick? We have a vendor in for that as well. So there's some really good things that I'm expecting to see out of that to give people an idea yeah. of the different possibilities. And our friends at Trend Micro just recently got involved with that. And, and thank you again for your leadership, Jerry, and that, uh, that you've taken on a big, big task. And uh, I can't wait to see the progress and, and what the results are going to be out of that. Okay. Oh, I, thank it's you very been much. my honor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next up, we'll go with Mr. Duffy. We got the, the last two government folks are old friends in new places. So, but Bobby, you can talk about where you are now a little bit and give a background about your agency. I think that'd be pretty cool. And then uh, what's been going on since you've recently got there? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I just got here in July, so I'm new to um, the Merit Systems Protection Board. So a little bit on what we do. Um, we're the independent agency that's tasked with managing federal employees' appeal, appeals to furloughs, demote, demotions, terminations, or suspensions. Um, our enterprise, we have eight regional offices throughout the country. Uh, my customer, basically 250 attorneys. Um, that, that's kind of, it's what we kind of do. So we do real-time adjudication, real-time um, rulings and, and decisions. So the big thing I came on board, the good thing, we had a lot of flexibility for a small agency. So I was dealt with a good hand. The one thing we had, so we, one thing I, the first thing we did was double, was double down on our bandwidth connectivity uh, with headquarters on the West Coast. Um, that made life a little bit easier. We maintain our VDI and did no major upgrades during since February. So some of our modernization efforts were just put on pause right there, not to disrupt that, that, that environment. Um, and we're able to roll out more virtual machines that way. Um, we had a BYOD and GFE on the enterprise mobility side, so that made it easier. We kept those policies in place. And we also had a good relationship with acquisitions to revamp and buy. Um, we went with Zoom for government um, for video and audio, and that worked really well in case we had a video record, a, a, a hearing, or, or something kind of really important. We're able to work closely very close with our privacy office 508 uh, and our records management team for those for those public records. So uh, dealt with a good hand, like where we're going, um, and, and and that's it. Great, thank you, Bobby. Yeah, and uh, Nikesh, I know you're another one that uh, recently moved, and maybe you can tell us about your last pit stop. That has been basically the front lines of. Uh, this uh, crisis, and you're right in the middle of all that. It'd be kind of good to talk about where your last pit stop. Sure, sure. Thank you all for uh, attending today again. So I'm Nagi Shrao, and I'm currently the acting CIO for the Bureau of Industry and Security within the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, that bureau is a National Law Enforcement Bureau and a, a National Security Bureau. Uh, uh, small bureau, but fights above its weight class. It deals with issues around export control and export administration and uh, export compliance. And so uh, I'm now helping evolve that bureau's IT modernization under the uh, vision and guidance of Andre Mendez and, and Larry Anderson and team at Commerce overall, as we seek to adopt more SaaS-based solutions um, the Bureau is a little bit unique because it's a national security bureau. So the way we deal with our IT systems and our data and data fidelity and, and whatnot is a, is a bit unique. It's, it's, it's more akin to the defense and intelligence community. So, uh, and, and so, and because that's a unique bureau, very unique compared to the rest of the bureaus and agencies at Commerce, it, it lends itself to some interesting challenges that we will uh, be, uh, you know, Waiting through through over or over the years ahead while I'm there, but uh, right now we're in the middle of a whole cloud migration called adoption process. We are embracing SaaS and SaaS based solutions. This pandemic, if anything, has uh, revealed that silver lining, which is that the need for mobile device solutions and and cloud mobility uh, to be able to do your job effectively. And so I, I'm excited to be leading that transition forward and. And over the year, next couple of years, seeing BIS evolve its IT uh, posture. Um, prior to my arrival to the Bureau of Industry and Security back in the end of June of this year, I was at the U.S. Small Business Administration as the Director of Business Technology Solutions, uh, working under the tutelage of Maria Rote and Guy Cavallo. Uh, I, I think many of you know Maria recently moved over to 
OMV is the federal deputy CIO for the uh, federal government. And as of earlier this week, Guy Cavallo has been named the principal deputy CIO for OPM, and he'll be heading off in a couple of weeks. And so it was, it was kind of interesting, you know, Maria left at the uh, end of May, early June, and then I, I took off and got my uh, opportunity soon after, and now Guy did as well. And, and uh, it, I think it's a testament to the great work we did uh, with our peers and colleagues at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, and, and as Tom alluded, I was definitely on the front line. I was part of the COVID-19 leadership response team, uh, handling technical direction with Maria on, on uh, how we were going to handle our technology solutions, uh, to technology solutionizing for the what uh, everyone now knows is the PPP and IDLE programs as part of the $2 trillion uh, CARES Act. And so I was front and center on that. It was my team that was working with the, our Office of Disaster Assistance and Office of Capital Access to administer and develop the technology solutions for those programs, uh, almost entirely glitch-free. Were there glitches? Yes. Were there some robots that was bound to happen, given the fact that we were given you know, less than two weeks notice to have IT solutions ready to go to accept applications whether it was from idle through the idle program for, directly from the small businesses for their economic injury disaster loan, or whether it was through uh, the the our bank the banking partners for the paycheck protection program, where a small business would instead go through the bank, and then the bank would process it through our systems. And so uh, that required a very you know ongoing collaborative relationship with our peers in the Office of Capital Access and Disaster Assistance to support them on that because we were looking at enterprise solutions for those technology uh, endeavors. And uh, and uh, I'm still kind of shocked we pulled through it and, and $700 billion later made it made it work without it being a disaster. And 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 you distributed like more on the average day for a couple of weeks there than you than you usually distribute yeah. in how many years? Something crazy? Yeah, over, over, yeah, they said each day was like more than like what we did in the history of the program kind of thing. It was ridiculous the, the amount of dollars we were pushing out and the, and the fact it was not uh, uh full of glitches it was seamless and it got better over time and that's you know a testament again to my team my colleagues and and our, our approach like okay let's build the solution out and then refine and improve over time so every day we were just continuously iterating and improving as soon as we saw you know a, a glitch happen we, we jumped on it immediately and said okay it got that glitch what other glitches might occur because of that that glitch and you know mitigate any cascading effects that could have occurred um it was it, i mean i mean i literally took 2 a.m phone calls along with my team i was i was that see uh that kind of guy where i didn't just put it on my team i i got in the trenches with my team we built a virtual command center so as i saw everything coming uh coming to play in early March, I jumped on it with my leadership and I said, I think we need to get ready for a virtual finance center if everyone's going to telework. And, you know, Maria and Guy were already making sure everyone was telework ready with the laptops we had provisioned to our SBA staff. And I said, we got to get ready for this. And so, you know, Melvin Brown, who is a dear friend, he, he and I were tag teaming ideas and, you know, working with leadership, we said, let's use Teams. And so I asked my team, Andrew Fabrizio, Ryan Corn, Eric Crawford, they jumped on it. We built a team site pretty quickly, uh, MS team site, and we just got everyone at the agency to quickly have to adopt and, and adapt to the use of collaboration tools to move forward. And uh, it worked. I, 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 yeah, I think we're going to look at the, we're going to think, I think we're going to look at the SBA effort down the line and just, I don't know where we're going to be as an economy, but I know we'd be in a lot worse if, you, if that if we had some major hang up and we couldn't distribute that money, I think a lot of companies would have folded that otherwise wouldn't. I mean, that's, that's, that's an yeah, obvious. Yeah. And, and I'll just close with this because I don't want to monopolize the time, but um, that pandemic we're facing right now has really shown why we have to ensure good IT governance, IT structure, SaaS based solutions. This is why you go cloud. This is cloud smart policy, you know, spot on. And, um, Gov IT is a unique beast. It is very different than commercial IT. I know a lot of people like to go and, 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 and you know, squawk around like a chicken and say, oh, you can, you, you should do it this way. Or, you know, there are a lot of backseat drivers out there. And, and, I, and, and what I'd like to just remind the backseat drivers are, 
unless you're in the front seat driving or in shotgun navigating, uh, keep your mouth shut. Just, just keep yeah. it shut because yeah. you're not the pig. The pigs are committed in the game. The chickens, they just put an egg into the dish and, and squawk around. So, you know, that, that's my, my, I, I want to, I want to iterate that publicly to everyone. All the backseat drivers out there who come at GovIT Gov folks who do get the job done. And then when you come and you try to throw some shade at us, go piss off because I, I'm done with it. I'm 20 years in the game. I'm just absolutely done with it. When you can achieve the track records that me and my peers have done, then come and start knocking my door and tell me how I could do my job better. But I delivered, my peers have delivered. So to the haters, walk away. Because if you keep it up, I'm gonna come come knocking on your door and, and knock you out as I'm I'm done with it. I, I gotta I gotta I like put it. my testament out there. I gotta put my testament <laughs> out there. I, I'm done with it. And I think my peers on this call are done with it too. Yeah. One of one of, I have like a little private group chat with my team. It's like, how does he really feel about it? <laughs> just came I'm, across. I'm going to put it any better all, myself. I've decided to be all real. Okay, we'll, we got you. We got you fired up. Uh, good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's a good start to this thing. Uh, last but certainly not least, we have Mr. John Clay from Trend Micro, and and John, really looking forward to your perspectives. You have you, you work across government, but you also work across other sectors, which I always think is fascinating. You know, financial, healthcare. Um, can you give us a state of, of of some of these other organizations as well as what you see across government? I, I'm looking forward to your perspectives. John, you're on mute or something. Hey, I heard something move around. Is it your... Okay, hang on. We'll... We'll get you on. Don't feel too bad. I think I was in one of these webinars. I talked for three minutes and I was on mute and I never noticed. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get you, John. How about I, does that work? Yeah, Tom, can you hear me? We, we can hear you. And I was saying, John, I, don't worry about it. I was on a I know. Serious <laughs> webinar with thousands of people. I don't know if one of everybody caught. I was talking about mute for three minutes, so don't worry yeah, about it. Sometimes that uh, is. Did sometimes. you hear my question? I did. I did. So, you know, okay, it's, good. it's been an interesting, uh, 2020, obviously the pandemic hit, you know, trend micro, we, we monitor threats from all our customers, right? Our customer, we have 500,000 commercial customers, including government agencies all over the world. And the thing that has been interesting to watch is that, you know, we've seen threat actors take advantage of the, the, the issues, the incidences that come up over the years, but this was like, gold to them, right? Because one, it was a global issue. Everybody is dealing with it. It's given them so much opportunity to do socially engineered attacks um, and regularly change them because there's always new news about this pandemic that's going on. So they're using every new piece of news that comes out and targeting the employees inside these organizations. Uh, the thing that we're seeing a lot of uh, the majority of the threats we see today are email based. So, you know, as, as, um, as our customers move to office 365, for example, a lot of them are moving there because of the, uh, because they're moving to the cloud and that's one quick way to get to the cloud. Um, but the threat that's coming through email is just massive. I mean, we saw 9 million co just COVID related uh, threats in the first half and 93% of those are email based. So, and each email tends to have both a link and an attachment. So it's been interesting to watch how they evolve, what the lures that they're using, you know, whenever any new piece of news comes up, all of a sudden within a you know, couple hours, you're seeing emails focusing on that uh, piece of news. So it's just insane. You know, that's kind of interesting. So DHS did this study a little bit ago and they did it like free Redskin tickets or something like that. And pretty much the response they got was overwhelming how many people clicked on it. Should government agencies be still drilling, especially during these times? I mean, it seems yeah, like that is. You know, Tom, it's interesting. We did a survey recently uh, for um, 
and, and actually worked with a psychologist to look at the personas of people that are, that are moving to the cloud and the different employee personas that we're seeing in the cloud. And, you know, what we have found, uh, what we found in that is there's four types of employees. There's fearful, conscientious, ignorant, and daredevil. And the interesting thing about it is, is in, in order to help these, these persona, these employees, one of the things we saw routinely is, is doing simulations, especially on the fishing side. Yeah. So testing your employees on a regular basis uh, with simulated phishing attacks that you can monitor, you can manage, you can see who's clicking, who isn't clicking. You can customize those things, you know. Um, we even have a, a, a tool that people can use for free and we already have preloaded COVID related emails that you can just click boom and send it to your, your employees and see. And it does help, no question about it, because you know, the more you can keep them aware of the situation, keep you aware that they are going to be targeted on a regular basis from, uh, from outside in, uh, the more you're going to get them thinking about security and thinking about maybe, you know, maybe not going through their email as fast as they used to go through a little bit more, you know, with a little more rigorous looking at who's bringing it, who's sending it to me, what are they sending, that kind of stuff. It definitely helps for sure. I, I got to, I got to agree with that completely. I think um, the, this pandemic definitely showed where our debt is with, with respect to IT infrastructure and cybersecurity. Absolutely because everyone all of a sudden is forced to now remote work. And so they're using their computers a lot more. So I think you, you, had, you had two things happen. You had uh, better, you saw better iterations and better development of technology at a faster pace because there's so much more adoption happening. And so you had more data points popping up saying, okay, this is working, this isn't working. So you had that flare of happening. But at the same time, you had so many people who were new to this notion of remote work. I think the percentages before pandemic was like, I think, 15 or 20 percent. I got. I got to look at the numbers again. Uh, I remember reading it in the New Yorker or something like that. But it was very low. It was much lower than I had really thought there had been for you know the entire workforce or global workforce. Right. And, and it yeah. was because of the pandemic. All of a sudden, you got everyone using remote work, and then all of a sudden, you got a lot more folks who are going, "Whoa, how do I, how do I do this? What do I do here?" And so that that reiteration into the heads for folks about cyber skilling and 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 being a little bit more mindful of what you click and what you do especially for those those of us in the federal community it's still imperative because you definitely saw a lot of malicious actor pop up trying to take advantage absolutely the phishing i've never i mean sba my former colleagues i feel bad for them there are folks who are popping up uh fake sites trying to pre present themselves as as third-party brokers for the PPP and IDLE, I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is crazy. Well, there's a war right now going on for uh, home routers. Yeah. The, oh, botnet, yeah. the botnet owners yeah. are going after everybody's home router. Uh, they're doing they're doing brute force attacks like crazy. We're seeing billions of uh, brute force attacks on, on home accounts through their routers, trying to find, you know, their router uh, credentials, all that kind of stuff. So crazy. Yeah, we're actually... We're actually starting a group in, in about telecommuting, and I think all these issues got to be looked at. And and then you have workers when you have this crisis, they're fearful. You know, like things are changing, and they might be more susceptible to things they otherwise wouldn't click on. You know, I think there's a lot of behind the psychology of it. Um, so anyway, my first question, which wasn't on the list because I just heard so much good stuff, is how do we? So we we have this crisis. People react in amazing ways. How do we, it's like almost like going to war, right? You go to war, you, you make things happen, you get, you get it done. How do we, when things calm down here, how do we take that purpose of innovation and getting things done? Maybe not at that intensity where you're up at 2 a.m. every night, but how can we kind of like, uh, you know, bottle this and, and get thing, have more of a, a, of a get things done and take our shovel ready projects and get them done? What, what do we... What do you think is going to change after this? Is, is government fundamentally going to change a little bit? And, you know, we yeah. built the Pentagon 18 months in World War II. You know, we, we could, you know, it usually takes 18 months to publish a DOD memo, you know, except for COVID. Now, COVID, they came out with the telecommun telecommuting one. They came out with that in like a couple of weeks. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Anybody, I would love for everybody to kind of comment on that. And yeah, what do you Tom. think the long lasting effects of this are? 
Yeah, Tom, I'll give you a perspective from a small agency is the risk management board, situational awareness, at least once a month, if not every two weeks, we're all talking about that. This is business risk of data loss to the agency. And, that, and that's key right now, I think we can talk to, um, you know, getting the right business owners and the decision makers right there to have that discussion about physical and logical risks. Um, you know, you could tie that into some of your, your poems and what have you at a high level. I think this is a good time to start having those discussions. It might get you to move more aggressively to the cloud if you were struggling before the pandemic. And I know some of the modernization efforts are probably on hold during the pandemic. So I would restart right now with just the known risks and have that discussion with leadership. Yeah. Anybody? I hope so, everybody has a chance to at least add some something. George? Can you hear me? I'm uh, on audio instead of the uh, uh, video. We can hear you fine. We can actually see you too. Oh, great. So I, I think, you know, telework is certainly here to stay, but in terms of tech change, change I think there's an absorptive uh, capacity that each agency has. And when you're throwing a whole bunch of new tools at them, all you do is frustrate the, uh, uh, the users because they have to learn something that they hadn't learned before. Uh, and sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. I know we've uh, I've uh, tried ZoomGov, we are using WebRTC, uh, WebX uh, products, uh, even some Adobe. So there's a whole bunch of avenues for people to, uh, to collaborate, uh, probably not to the degree that we uh, should yet, uh, because there are a bunch of collaboration tools that aren't approved for use on our networks as well that uh, we need to start investigating, you know, like Mural and uh, ones like that. Uh, the other uh, issue we have is sometimes uh, the work that we do is classified, and trying to do classified teleworking is a uh, uh, is an issue that's going to be reckoned with too. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to do super from home. So. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? Is there some some is it going to ever happen? I mean, it, it's like uh, are people going to share skiffs? You know, what 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 would you? How do you manage that? Well, you know, right now we have super phones, and so you could do some, uh, you could check emails, you can't do uh, mm -hmm. uh, secure VTC, but uh, their products are coming down that, uh, I know one of the ones that we're using uh, is uh, called SecureView, developed by Rome Labs, uh, a government, an AFRL lab yeah. in Rome, New York, that uh, uh, we're starting to, uh, well, start beginning to deploy. We're installing it right now, but uh, a few months from now, probably December is our IOC date with that. Uh, to, to try to get SIPR a little bit more broadly uh, used across the uh, agency for folks who need it when they're not at the headquarters. So. Yeah, yeah. Renata, I'd love to hear a little more from you because that's your world, if you want to add some color to that. Well, um, on the on-class side, again, I agree with the co um, my colleagues that telework isn't going anywhere and starting out with your, your known knowns on risks um, and making some business decisions Absolutely. Um, I think for me, um, I think the technical piece is easy for us to express about. Like that part is easy. I think it's going to be more of how do you get the user adoption and the user population to adjust at steady state um, what, norm, what the new normal is. Um, I think psychologically, everyone is adjusting because they're kind of forced to. Right? They're forced to stay home, they're forced to quarantine, they're forced to work from home. Um, when, the, when the luxury of choice psychologically resonates with everyone again, it will be interesting to see who prefers to push back a little bit or be a little bit rebellious on well, why can't I come back into the office? Because it can sometimes be very difficult to work from home depending on what they're trying to access. So. Um, that user adoption and training is going to be something Marine Corps really hones in on with all of our users and workforce. I like to call it a catalog of choice. You know, Mr. DZ is looking at, um, you know, accessing all of our applications from a commercial environment directly from your Wi-Fi BYOD type of perspective. Um, not that any other agency is more important than um, its sister agency. But there are certain things that are even unclassified that becomes very sensitive when you know a threat actor can aggregate large amounts of data. So then it starts to change the game. So something that we got to think about: user adoption, keeping that awareness up, 
um, not getting too complacent um, and, and comfortable, um, as well as making sure we vet our tools. Um, I, like, I like to hear George talk about being very close to their acquisition team, like Nagesh mentioned. And the supply chain is so very important as we start to, to ramp up and make things make make um, capabilities available to the workforce. So I think it's going to be user adoption and my and, and that training model um, because I think the decision making of risk acceptance, et cetera, I think that'll be easy for us. I think the hard work is going to come from the adoption of whatever steady state looks like for us. Yep. yep. Jerry, did you want to add anything? Go ahead. Yeah, um, so we we had to make a lot of, um, you know, things against our normal policies, of course. You know, we were worried about, you know, things like, you know, we had passwords expiring every 60 days, um, you know, and people teleworking. It's a little more difficult. We do have pass self-password reset, but so we, we had to do things and, and policies. And one thing I don't think I heard from anybody else, and we're all IT people, we're here to support the mission. Uh, we're not here, our agencies aren't here to do IT, but in order to support the mission, and if we're all teleworking, what do we do about our administrators? Um, how are they going to do their work uh, from off-site in, in teleworking? So we've done dedicated admin workstations for those folks. Um, the help desk, of course, you know, they're usually in a command center and, you know, on a call vectoring system. We've allowed the whole help desk to telework through a call management system in the cloud um, that does all the call vectoring. So we're tracking a bunch of policy uh, or things that went against normal policy that we've had to allow in order to keep the business going, of course. So what we are doing right now is we're reviewing, all right, what do we keep? What is risky? And, you know, we may have done things a little quick, so we have to look at the, you know, are we sure that this is as secure as it's supposed to be if we're going to keep this going forward? So we're taking, um, just like the other gentleman said, a risk assessment. Um, against all of those things. So it's, it's, it's all about the risk tolerance, um, what, what you're gonna allow or not. Yeah, yeah, what's the, appetite, we, what, what's the appetite level of the senior leadership? That's a good point, excellent. Yeah. And once you have, if you have that casual conversation, I think that's a good start. I, I, I definitely yeah. agree on that risk appetite. And, and something else I wanted to mention, you know, I was hearing Gerald and, and George and Renata mention about with the, with, with SIPR and, and especially with the more secure uh, IT systems that we have to have, I think what you're probably going to start seeing is the government, well, I hope, uh, a more collaborative engagement, right? So I, I know at BIS we have SIPR terminals and a, and a, and a SCIF workspace environment for our more sensitive uh, endeavors that we do work with, with with respect to the Department of Defense and State Department with the uh, um, export administration policy. but. Uh, I'm hoping part of my, my, my outlook is how do I work with those agencies a little bit more effectively to, you know, maybe co-share or, co you know, some co-sharing model with respect to some of these remote work stations that we might have to set up, especially a remote works environment where we can work together on that front. So it is going to be interesting how this all plays out, but I, I think telework is definitely here to stay for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, you know, and how about, it, what, yeah, what's interesting, you know, we've been we've been monitoring the uh, underground communities and the forums that they do. And one of the things that we've seen just over the last year, year and a half, is that the targeting of home user home employees. So this is, again, another huge opportunity that the threat actors and the malicious actors saw is when people move to the home. Um, it gave them an opportunity, right? Because, you know, think about it. You're, you're probably looking at your business email, but you're also working at your home email. Could be on the same system, right? So they can get double yeah. options for, for phishing. But the other thing, I, and, and a couple of people made a, a point here about education. And one of the things we see in organizations that move to the cloud, the big, one of the biggest challenges they have is skill set, right? People aren't trained to understand the cloud right there's no there's not a lot of classes you can take in university on what what a cloud is all of us that are on the panels we learned everything that we know today on the job right so i didn't go to school for cybersecurity back in the 80s right so um and one of the things that we're seeing uh the threat actors take advantage of are misconfigurations 
people just misconfigure their S3 buckets or they misconfigure, you know, some uh, uh, a, a, an open IP that's, that's out there in the internet. And the bad guys understand that and they are scouring the internet for any open IP. Once they find it, they analyze it. Hey, is it a cloud account? Is it, they do a brute force attack against it. So, you know, the more that an organ, as an organization moves to the cloud, they definitely need to take the time to get their personnel trained on using the cloud properly. Um, and then one other, the last thing I'll, I'll point out is um, automate it as we can. So, you know, we have a, a, an application that actually analyzes all the configuration changes on your cloud accounts. And if you make a bad decision, it'll alert you. It'll say, hey, you, you, shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be making that change. So organizations, right. there are tools available. And that's the, the last thing I'll say is that the nice thing, I think with this, with everybody working from home, one of the things we're going to see is a lot new, more new tech for all of these types of environments. And you're gonna see that starting to come out. But again, that introduces more, another risk issue because in, in an education issue that's gonna happen. Oh yeah, I, I think that's, it's timely for us to have something about telecommuting because it's like, how do I work as effectively? There's a, just so many issues, home security. How do you isolate your, I, your business data from your home data right especially if you're a if you're right. using the same machine which a lot of people are using the same machine uh, for both their home and their work now sure and uh, I'm gonna give us some poll questions but I want to ask something because if somebody's asked some questions of you dr. do check but we can kind of do it for everybody how about the, you know with the concept of zero trust you know when you're working remote that sounds like a pretty good having you know really good to look at your zero trust architecture um, can you comment about that at the DLA? Um, and if anybody else wants to chip in, please do. Yeah, just uh, just on the previous point, though, I'd like to you know just echo the uh, sure. uh, you know John's comments about uh, uh, you know configuration and then automation. Uh, that's uh, the other thing uh, when he was talking about training that we saw a need for is training on how to write good contracts for uh, cloud services or cloud uh, uh, products. So. Um, I, I don't think we got that down yet. Everyone's kind of a trial and error one right now. I know uh, Defense Acquisition University has a book that they basically published on how to do yeah. it, but uh, everyone's somewhat unique. So uh, yeah, I, I would also refer you before you go to the next question. While I think of it, I have to like say it right that second, or I'll forget. Uh, the Cloud Information Center at GSA—they're really starting to assemble like uh, some agencies that have left contracts where you can kind of maybe borrow some of the language. Not everything is not to the DOD standards, but there might be some, they're starting to do a lot of that. So you can take, hey, I really like this concept of, you know, bed ramp or something, and then grab it and go put it in your proposal. So Cloud Information Center, GSA is a resource. But go ahead, Dr. Duchek. I mean, that's excellent. We're starting to assemble this body of knowledge that you need. And, you know, if you want good yeah. service, you have to have a good contract. Uh, with, uh, with respect to zero trust, though, we're just uh, beginning that uh, journey. So uh, we have a massive modernization effort going on right now where we've, uh, we've closed, uh, well, by the end of this calendar year, we'll, we'll have closed 21 of 23 data centers uh, and have two remaining that will close within the next couple of years. Uh, but uh, we're building out a, uh, a, a new architecture that's organized around data uh, with the future being in uh, analytics, or data analytics and AI, so uh, hence the new uh, new architecture. Um, but uh, part of that new architecture is creating this uh, you know single sign-on DLA platform, uh, where the users then will have, as you mentioned, uh, 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 essentially a persona that gives them the ability to only do certain things on the network. Right now, once you're in the network, you're in the network. Uh, but if you're a buyer, you may only be able to do certain things. If you're just if you're a, a help desk uh, uh, person, you may be only do other things. If you're an executive, you may not be allowed to go anywhere in the network. <laughs> uh, but uh, I love it. Uh, we're, we're moving in that. We're just moving in that direction now. But I think it, uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about so far, with uh, the uh, increased uh, uh, attack surface, the uh, the escalating threat uh, environment, uh, you have to go to something like zero trust. You shouldn't trust anybody or anything on your network until it's verified. Great. Anybody else want to add to that? Oh, I would love to chime in on zero trust. This is my favorite subject. 
I'm absolutely a Zero Trust fan. Um, I've been advocating for this. I've been televangelizing for this for a while. This peanut butter spread approach that I call it that we do today um, culturally, I think, um, and, and focus on compliance is just, we're we're not utilizing our resources. What is it? You, you have to know what you're trying to protect, and at the end of the day, you're trying to protect your data. You got to know where your data is. You got to know the categorization of that data. You got to know where that data is going. Um, you know, I and and the thing about you know a lot of people come from zero trust from the identity um, direction. Well, that didn't necessarily protect my data. I did something about access and authentication, right. but I still got to protect my data and put my controls and my protections closer to my data, and I'm not going to protect my bologna sandwich like my crown jewels. Um, and it can't be linear. Right now, we do things very linear. You authenticate, and then you ha then you get your access, and then there you go. It's like going to the movies. They take your ticket in the lobby, and you can walk into any movie practically nowadays. Um, you, you don't want to do that. So you have to constantly check, and, and it goes back to your risk tolerance as well. So if, you know, you authenticate from a certain a certain way, you come in from a certain network, if it's unmanaged, I may have a higher risk level than if you came from a managed network. Um, I, so I'm, if you come from a managed network, a well-known network, you authenticated with a PKI card, I'm pretty sh sure you are who you are, then my risk is going to be lower. But if you're coming in from a Starbucks, an unknown network, on a personal device, my risk might go up a little, so I might not let you do certain things like download and print. And then I got to constantly check against that because um, yeah. some things can happen while person, people are accessing data. So you really got to have all this telemetry and take in all these factors and have that dynamic risk evaluation all the time while people are accessing said data. Totally an AI type of issue. You know, you, I mean, what if I'm on vacation? Do I get limited access to certain things, you know, or, I mysteriously appear in a foreign country. You got to know that. Um, lot, well, lots, Tom, to, think, lots to do know, there. Yeah. Least privilege, least privilege needs to be built in, right? Who has the, who just, yeah. you know, don't give it to everybody. You know, only certain people need to get their multi-factor, all that good stuff. The other thing is, is most of the cloud vendors now have encryption for data at rest automatically. I mean, it's, it's you know as you move to the cloud you can you can encrypt your data much more effectively using a cloud provider than you could using your own facility you know sort of speak so I think that's another area that people can think about as they're um, when they move to the cloud you know least privilege and, and encryption of data so so John's absolutely correct and I would add the least privilege just in time you don't always need the access. So only elevate when you need it. Like we elevate our admins, for instance, our privilege admins, and we take it away after a certain time frame. And I think the other thing is, is data in motion. It's not always a user accessing data, and you have to understand where you you have to baseline where your data is going and make sure that that is normal. Because if something happens, some trigger has to go off, and you got you you have to have some policy action. So I, I think. You know, very important what John says, but, you know, just to add a little bit onto that, um, those are a couple of more important points I would make on the subject. Yeah, and just know most Thank ransomware you, actors today are going to steal your data before they encrypt it and try and get a ransom. So they're going to double ransom you with uh, whether it's the, the stuff that's encrypted at rest or they're going to steal it first and then try to sell, try to extort you for it. Just to kind of talk in on the um, the zero trust, I think the uh, technical solutioning is, is going to be there. The architecture guidance is out there. Um, that's going to be the easy part to understand. And then the analysis of, of your own environment and how do you um, use the recommended architecture and design for, for that. But I think what we'll very quickly gloss over, uh, we, don't, we don't hear a whole lot of conversation about is how does zero trust work? Zero trust works based on data and it's based on that person or that data's behavior. And so the AI that you mentioned and the machine learning that's gonna come in, if you have garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out. So if you're not truly examining your workforce and, and creating those things that are needed to feed the algorithms, that's going to help the machine learn that person's behavior or that data set's behavior, then we're gonna have a larger problem. So, so what we spend a lot of time on at Marine Corps is 
not really solving for the techie part because uh, our everyone's solving the technical issue. You know, we're coming up with tools, we're having all those kinds of conversations, but something as simple as just your internal, I, I don't like the word hygiene, but the protocols and, and tools and techniques that you use internally. Um, I think it was Rob that said, er, Robert that said it earlier about governance, your IT governance. Um, and it may have been the guest as well as he talked through the scenarios that he had an experience at SBA. If that governance is not in place and the compliance and then that auditory oversight, then you can feed all the analytics in the world and your zero trust is going to get had. And the reason is because, well, it looks, that looks like Renata coming in from her daughter's apartment, but we don't know because we didn't collect that kind of data. And oh, by the way, we don't have the algorithms in place for the machine to learn through multiple authentication that, yeah, that's something new for her, but that is her. Um, so I have three points. The second point is I like this thing that the bank does when it text messages me and says, hey, you use that debit card in Louisiana. We know yeah. you're from there, but you didn't put your card on travel. And I'm like, what is putting my card on travel? I don't understand that. So the read that technology was so, um, I was so grateful for that technology because I started to get the phone calls from, you know, the system saying we turned your card off because it looks like, you know, you, you, you are not using your card from the normal location. So, so that was the second thing, just trying to relate already in place technology that's already kind of sort of been adopting that zero trust. Um, and then the third piece is, I think of zero trust like our building. In my SCIF, I go inside the building, but then I got to scan again and put another PIN number in. And as soon as I go out of that room, I can get to two or three places without yet another door forcing me to scan my badge again and, and type it in. And when I'm in a hurry, that zero trust is not, I, I really don't like having to scan yet another door, but that's the way I think about it. I can get to the bathroom oftentimes without scanning, but as soon as I wanna go from one office to another, it's almost like physically, you're, you, okay, you're supposed to be here, you're in the building, but should you be in this room? And quite honestly, there are places in our building where I don't have access to, and I know that others have experienced that as well. Bobby Nagesh, anything to add? I guess you're on. To, there you go. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I agree with everyone. I agree with everything what everyone is saying, and and um, the governance is so critical. Uh, it, it's not even funny having that right policy set, and and I think what's also more important is you're going to have to have buy-in. Um, across the agency, right? Because I've, I've noticed that <clears throat> with some of the agencies, we uh, let's not let's not kid ourselves. There's still a lot of shadow IT workforces out there, right? So even if the OCIO shop says this is the policy and this is how we want it to go forward, you might have other divisions kind of buck the trend or not go forth with that with that process, and 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 that's culminating in either they're just unknowledgeable or they just don't care or they. Um, don't have the right resources. And so I think what's going to be really important for us as the, as the government is to really figure out how we can better enterprise our services across the board. I know that was a big thing Suzette was trying to push forward um, yeah. before she left is she was trying to look at, okay, which agencies do certain um, IT services really well? And then is there a way to leverage that so that there's an enterprise platform or enterprise service that we can then all sign in through and, uh, and, and utilize it. I think case in point, with everyone having to work from home more and more, you know, we were talking about that, that, that the administrator access and, and all that stuff, you know, that all co comes down to having equipment that can work from home yeah. and, and having that single sign-on capability with, a, with the, your cat card or whatnot. Like, these are simple things. These are, this is not entirely difficult, but we have to adopt some standardization and adopt a, a framework that we all can agree upon and work with, you know, for systems that might be moderate and systems that might be, you know, classified and, and, and secret and whatnot. And if we can do a proper job of delineating and, and saying these are the sandboxes we work with and work off that, I think we'll get a lot farther down the road than, than, than I think most folks would realize. Great. We're, we're running out of time, but I had been neglectful. I'd like to do a couple polls. We still got a lot of people on. Uh, maybe we'll do a couple polls and then wrap it, wrap it up. I think we're, we're headed to overtime real quick. So Alyssa, if you can pop a couple, couple poll questions while we have so many people on. Where are you and your agency with your cloud infrastructure? No plans to use public cloud. Um, 
we have plans to deploy public cloud this year. We deployed some public cloud infrastructure. We're utilizing public cloud regularly. And the second question, which I think I can get to, well, I can't see it online. Uh, well, I've got my iPad today rather than my full computer, so I couldn't see the second question. But anyway, uh, please get back real quick and we'll see if we can get glean anything important out of the results. So can we put the results up, Alyssa? Okay. What are you, okay, so no plans to use public cloud. We have plans to deploy public cloud this year. We de deployed some public cloud infrastructure. We're using public cloud regularly. Ah. <sighs> Are we gleaning that if they're using public cloud, maybe it's for citizen services or releasing public information? I, I you know, I think, uh, I mean, we're, I, I think we've kind of determined, what do I take, what do we take out of this? Anybody want to comment? Well, it looks like a lot of them, I mean, 66% are, have some deployed or regularly using it. So cloud definitely looks, appears to be at being adopted. Obviously it's being adopted in areas that can adopt it, right? Certain areas probably can't adopt it. But then, and then the second question, um, you know, what's your biggest challenge? Yeah. 53% uh, say uh, security of data, right? So, and I think that's still the, the, and we've seen this is the number one issue that organizations, why they don't move to the cloud is they're concerned about security. Well, I think I actually heard, I won't mention the person, it was somebody at SBA actually told me they had a survey of all the CIO agencies. And I think 60% said they were still concerned, can, can still, uh, still concerned about security. So I think that that's definitely a thing. So anyway, I, I know Renata had a drop, uh, Thank you, Renata. I'll text her later. Uh, any last comments that anybody feels like we didn't cover before we sign off? I would say cloud is here. It's here to stay. Um, you know, it's proven its value. And so I think we would be foolish not to embrace it as part of our, you know, IT tools in the toolkit. I, I think you're right, boy. It's been uh, it's been uh, cloud first policy came out like all, over 10 years ago. It, it's not like a question of whether you're going to be using it. You're, you're going to use it, John. You want I uh, you wanted to add something? Well, I just say um, it, it, as Nagesh said, it, it's here to stay. It's going to continue. Um, it's moving fast. I mean, AWS introduced you know, a hundred plus new services over the last two years. Uh, so again, challenge is going to be understanding it, learning it, educating your, your workforce around it, your IT personnel around it. Uh, but there are vendors like ourselves who are ready to help. We've got a lot of experience in it. We can help you with the migration. So, uh, but the threat actors are going to continue. Not, they're not stopping. <laughs> they're not stopping. They're, they're merciless. They only get put there clever abilities for good, but that, we all know that's not going to happen. We wish. Thank you, Nagesh, Bobby, George, Renata, Jerry, and John. This has been fantastic. A great conversation. It went by so fast. I was looking, looking and it was, it was over. Uh, next week, August 25th, we are doing something we haven't done before. We are doing um, a federal reskilling summit and we've got a whole bunch of, we, we've, we've, uh, how much did we talk about that today? Reskilling the federal workforce. And what I've learned in my time here at ATARC is you can have the best technology in the world. If, if the government isn't comfortable with it or doesn't have the skill set to implement this technology, you're not going to get anywhere. So this is the first of a, of a many, of a long range plan to really help with the, with the federal reskilling. I think, John, you said that, uh, hey, people get trained in, in, in something on their own. Well, you know, we want to be able to codify this that if you have a lot of experience in your agency i should be able to translate that to getting a job um so not it's not just getting a computer science degree i'm ready to do i'm ready to do cyber so this is going to be a fun 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 event and uh you know we are looking forward to it once again thanks to all the panelists thank you trend micro this has been great you brought in a lot of good ideas to this and uh we're very excited. Thank you very much. And also, we are going to be podcasting this webinar. We're st we just started doing that. So we'll have a replay and a pop podcast available if you want to ever forward it to a colleague. 
Thank you very much. And everybody have a good afternoon and a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.